G'day Reefers, I'm Anya and thanks for watching Gallery Aquatica TV. So today we're here in store and we're going to talk about coral pests, specifically with a focus on vermited snails. So, I guess the first question is, what are vermited snails? These creatures actually appear to look a lot like polychaete worms. They have a very curious looking shell for a mollusk, they're gastropod mollusks, and they have this long calcareous tube, and often it does have these kind of irregular coils, which kind of symbolizes what we generally understand as a standard snail. However, they are often coming out of your coralline algae or alongside the base of a coral or through your live rock and it can be a little bit difficult to initially identify. So, how do you know whether you have a polychaete worm, which is quite a desirable creature for your reef, or a nasty vermited snail. So, first of all, in appearance, the skeleton of the, sorry, the shell of the vermited is actually a little bit more of a kind of creamy browny color, and in the water it even appears a little bit of a reddish hue, where calcareous polychaetes will tend to have a beautiful little white uh, or purple shell, um, but the number one way I would suggest to look out for having these pests in your home aquarium is identifying the anterior end and the posterior end. So these snails actually feed by releasing this mucus net and this is part of why they are such a problem and why it's so important to remove them as soon as you can identify you have them present. That mucus net that they release is actually out there to catch detritus and plankton so that the snail can feast upon this but where that net lands on coral tissue it causes horrible impacts. It, the, the coral tissue will die, it will degrade, it will start to rot and then you end up with exposed skeleton which is free for nuisance algae and of course you know your beautiful coral suddenly starts to look really undesirable and unhealthy. So you're looking for the anterior end, potentially a mucus net and not a beautiful fan like a polychaete worm may have, but two antennae, just like a standard snail. Now there are a number of species of vermited pests available for us in aquariums. Um, some of them are colonial, such as this horrible example. Now I'll just focus a second here on what we're looking at here. This actually came out of the back of an aquarium that the boys on the road had been commissioned to take down because the poor clients just couldn't work out why their coral wouldn't make it. You test the water, there's still tissue dying, you think it's your strontium um, or calcium deficiency um, or perhaps that it's being stung by other corals but no matter what they did um, they could not find what the real problem was. It wasn't until Cameron and Adam were out there taking them to the tank that they found this monster lurking in the back of these poor customers live rock. And I actually broke it about half a year ago. So just for full effect, it was legitimately enormous. That is one foot long and almost sort of attractive here. There's probably three large individuals. So this one is a colonial species of vermitid. And you can see here, as it's bred, it's actually produced uh, babies which have landed and started to grow onto the colony. Um, so they can all take advantage of, of the detritus and plankton in the aquarium. Now, that was identifying them via the anterior end, so remember we're looking for antennas, a mucus net. 
but the posterior is the real key. So at the very base, just like other gastropod mollusks, you see this torsion and this one actually settled right on the glass. So when you are trying to identify wh what you're dealing with here, it's really this base that gives you the key and simply removing the top portion you can see why it, this method doesn't always work because the the snail will you know sense that there's a danger and go all the way down to the base and you can see here the dark parts are actually the the dead tissue here's another one we've got it's showing really really well um, how it's got that torsion it's got this calcareous tube and no matter how much snipping we could have done at the surface here this creature was capable of survival now one more amazing fact about why they are such a great pest um, if you can say so let's say it's so good at being a pest is because snails have an operculum now that is like a little cap that you might have seen on most of the gastropods in our aquarium and that cap protects them from predation and also desiccation so when you you know take this out of water it can actually trap a whole bunch of um, water in there and nutrients so even being out of water and I've tested this theory for over one whole day you put that back in the water and out it comes again so they are not only very resilient very uh, smart at being this nasty nuisance pest so firstly the trick is identify what you're dealing with one way to extend that mucus net to make it a lot clearer is actually to use particulate coral foods. Now, you could flip this around and some people use this as a control method actually. They feed their aquarium far less foods which actually kind of starves the population of vermitids. Um, now, I have read a number of people that said this worked for them. However, I am a big advocate of feeding coral, so I wouldn't suggest starving your aquarium, but certainly dealing with the clarity of your water with maybe like an ozone or some people suggested micro bubbles can certainly reduce their population numbers and decrease how frequently they are going to be breeding. So also there are some people who actually report that these are harmless that they are not going to actually do any damage to their coral and that they enjoy having this diversity of small animals within their reef. Now I'm uh, all for ethics and everything but this pest is actually destroying reefs out in the wild. There are numerous scientifically based articles um, written up with studies in situ and I have here a really horrific example of one of our clients clams which unfortunately died from a whole colony of attack and you do find the corals that tend to suffer the worst from these are actually ones that do not have stinging tentacles they have no defense or from shutting too much from the irritation they're not able to generate that same level of energy and stay healthy anymore from simply just the irritation of that mucus net. So some people argue, oh, when they're babies, they're fine, you're not gonna struggle with them. But this is an example of a giant clam which unfortunately lost its life because this got completely out of control. So if you have evidence of these tiny vermitids anywhere in your live rock or at the base of your coral, one trick I suggest is to find the breeding mother because these little guys are probably unlikely to release egg and sperm and multiply at enormous numbers um, initially, but if you have a lot like this, it really does mean somewhere 
lurking in your aquarium, you have one potentially this size and that's the one you want to identify, locate and remove as soon as possible. So now that you've identified that your aquarium may be struggling with a vermited snail invasion, you're going to have to consider a couple of the different options of how to control their numbers. So there have been quite a number of suggestions available online that we have extensively trialed over the years and I'm just going to go through some of them really briefly. So the first one that most people will suggest is as a successful method is gluing their anterior end with coral glue or putty. So this would then ensure that the snail is not receiving oxygen, food or able to reproduce. Now this method has worked for us and not worked because we are so good at being a pest sometimes they're actually capable of just turning around and moving their shell to be growing around the coral or even once through epoxy so this can work and is particularly good if you cannot reach that posterior end to physically lance or remove it but I think it's probably a good idea to go for a multi-pronged attack. Using coral cutters is for me the number one solution and once again prevention is the best cure so really scouring every new coral you receive in your care and locating that that is and identifying that you have a vermin in here it is time to snip it off and physically remove it before it gets out of hand. So this can work very well as long as you can identify that base where the torsion is. Um, sometimes on wild ones they are wrapping all the way around the base of the coral so you can be, it can be quite surprising how much snipping is required to get down to the real problem but coral snips are my number one choice of dealing with this pest. Another popular method of control that gets suggested out there is lancing. So this would involve getting a very thick sewing needle or even a knitting needle if you're dealing with a very thick large species of vermitid and puncturing through the entire body of the snail. Now don't forget this will only work if you can get right down into that base where it's likely the actual animal will be hiding. Um, sometimes it can be a little difficult to locate that section but lancing may be just the way to deal with some of these nasties in your home reef. So naturally we start to think there must be some predators out there in the wild that are controlling these populations. Well, yes and no. There could be evidence suggesting that Acropora crabs or pocky crabs are capable of cleaning them off their coral colonies. So that is one option, but it's still not going to clean your whole reef of these nasty pests. There are some people that will suggest wrasse, I guess uh, things like lime wrasse, I've seen yellow chorus suggested, and PJ. In our personal experience, we keep a lot of these pest eating wrasse in all our coral tanks, and we have unfortunately seen absolutely no benefit when it comes to these vermitids populations. I suppose there'd be things like pufferfish, larger growing wrasse, parrotfish that likely could destroy them but unfortunately the reason you want to remove them is so they're not harming your coral and these kinds of options are also not reef safe so I guess the best method would be to manually, manually get in there and utilize those pest eating fish as just a secondary backup. So we're going to take our frog spawn here and show you just how easy it is to just snip these buggers off. 
I'm really trying to find the base. Now it's okay to remove a little bit of that Coraline because, oh, how lovely, there's a bristle worm there too. Ew. We can remove all kinds of pests today. Fantastic. And just really swiftly, now if you don't have coral cutters, I'm guessing any kind of tool like this would be of assistance, but owning coral cutters is I think a priceless kind of tool to have in this hobby. I'm just gonna get this last one here, try not to damage the septa too much. And so you can see in a matter of seconds, we've removed potentially eight or 10 of these little buggers. The last method of control, which was suggested online, is the use of lasers. Now here in Australia, we unfortunately don't have access to those lasers that people use to zap Aptasia and other pests within the aquarium. But my friend Melov has actually suggested and proven that by burning the, the tissue within the shell with a strong laser, he has been able to successfully eradicate aquariums from vermited snail populations. So thanks Reefers for joining us today as we go through some of the ways to identify and control vermited snail pests. I hope to see you again soon and happy reefing. So that's our video for today. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button, hit the subscribe as well. We'll be putting out videos every week showing a, a new tank with new products. There's gonna be lots in all the videos. I'm Cam the Fish Guy and keep on reefing.